Beautiful people, beautiful church. Welcome in the house of God. Are you blessed? I am blessed. I am blessed. Just to encourage you in one verse. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agreed with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Ang aim po ng church ay restoration. Restu restoring lives. Yeah? Restoring our faith. So that we will be strong in trials and tribulation. I welcome... Uh, my dear sister here, her name is Marta. She is from Poland. She said she's lost. But I don't think that she's lost. You know why? There's no accident in God. God wants you to be here so that God will restore whatever bothers you. Okay? The God of peace will give you comfort because she said she wanted peace. You know that the Lord said, he gave peace that this world cannot give. So never let our heart be troubled. Trust in God. Okay? So just encourage you. I'm not preaching today. We had, a, we had a, a man of God preaching today. So brace yourself. Okay? Because we had a good topic this month of February. About love. So like you and me, we're so in love. In love with God, I'm sure. Okay? So anyone who wants to testify the goodness, the mercy of God, what the Lord have done to you this past week? Anyone? Kailangan mag-start ang pastor para may ginagandang Okay. Uh, magandang buhay. Good afternoon to everyone. We welcome you, uh, Sister Marta. Okay. So this is TJF, Temple of God International Fellowship. You're uh, most welcome here. Uh, we hope that this is not the first time that you will be coming. You know, as what uh, the Sister Sorina said, you're not lost. You know, uh, you are in the right place at the right time. Praise the Lord. Okay, so I would I'd like to thank the Lord for, uh, for of course, uh, a safe and sound uh, return of my darling. You know, my one and only. And uh, I thank the Lord for uh, you know. Uh, bringing her back, uh, you know, in one piece. And I really uh, am so positive that uh, he had done a very good job, you know, uh, being with her mom in America. So, uh, and we hope that uh, this is not the, the last time that she will see her mom. And we are always praying for her as well uh, while we are here. And, and we are really hoping that uh, one day, you know, we can also uh, see her and join us here, you know. And I would like, really like to thank the Lord for a safe and sound front. Thank you. Yes, safe and sound. Peace that this world cannot give. Anyone, anybody want to thank God? That's Lita to you, the pastor's wife. Uh, anyway, indeed, uh, God is good because uh, I arrived safely. And I think... Uh, I said God is good because uh, I was uh, conditioning my mom, talking to her most of the time about, you know, sharing about the love of God. And I know I have shared, we have shared to her before, but as time goes by, as we, you know, as I'm saying it to her about the past and everything, I know I can see her a lot of bitterness, which I said to her. I was not very happy hearing about that one. And I was very straightforward to her that, you know, uh, I hope, I wish that you will learn to forgive because that's the most important part in our life. As I reminded her that, you know, if you don't forgive, God will not forgive us. So time flies and I said to her, I conditioned her at that day. Uh, I'm leaving, flying back here on Saturday I'm flying back here on Saturday, and on that Friday, it will be my last night. And I'm not supposed to be, the, to be looking after her, because they said to me that uh, I should have a break, because it has been two days that I've been working 24 hours. So that Friday, they've given me a time to do a bit more of shopping and relax. But since I conditioned my mom that I said, 
I will be okay to be on duty by myself. Just uh, give me the floor because after this, kayo na ang mag ano sa mother sa mother natin. So I said God is good because they they said to me okay, and that's the time on that Friday that I have talked to my mom again and I asked. I asked her to accept Jesus Christ as her savior and, and to repent. And she accepted very willingly and, and I lead her to prayers, which is, I'm, I'm happy and very sad to leave her in her situation. So I praise God because I think though God made a way that I can go, go and and see her and I wish that more that I need more of your prayers that my mom will be, be okay. will be okay so thank you for everyone who shared your prayers for my mom and God bless yes prayers is very important we become uh, an army of God when we pray because the word of God said he is seated at the right hand of the father interceding for you and me okay so prayer is very important okay Romans 15 5 6 may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such a harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may be one voice glorifying God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ yeah, our aim is to encourage yeah, one another to live in such a harmony. Because if we are living in harmony, yeah, the Spirit of God is with us. And God will answer our prayer. Because that, what he, that is what he promised, isn't it? He will answer our prayer. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We glorify you. And dear Father, we are here again. As your children, Father, uh, ready to hear and acknowledge, O oh God, that you are, your Holy and Precious Spirit are in the midst of us, O oh God. Lord, open our hearts, yes. our minds, O oh God, that we may be able really to understand, comprehend, Father, the truth about your words, O oh God. Yes. Reveal to us everything, O oh yes. God, that we ought to know, that we may be able, Lord, to walk accordingly to your perfect will, O oh God, and ways. We praise you, Lord, and in the four corners of this room, O oh God, may your name be glorified, O oh God, in our midst. Lord, and if there are things that is unpleasant to you, Lord, we are committing unto you, Lord, we are laying it up to you, Lord. And may your uh, wisdom be upon us, your righteousness be upon us, O oh God, and that we may do the things that you want us to do, Lord. Lord, it is your perfect will that we are after, Lord, Amen. your righteousness. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, I entitled this message, actually, uh, To Love Somebody. You know? And as we are in uh, the love month, February, uh, that's why we're trying to uh, really uh, to know more about the love of God. You know, and the most important thing is how this love should affect or will affect our spiritual lives, especially, O oh God. So, uh, if I may ask first, is it hard to give all your love to somebody? I mean, all your hearts. How hard is it to love somebody with all your heart? Have you done that? For those who are married, for those who have partners, you know, do you love your partners, your wife, your husband with all your heart? How easy is it to fall in love with all your heart to somebody else? Those who have boyfriends or maybe those who have uh, secret admiration for someone, you may want crushes you, you know. Are you uh, have fallen in love with that somebody? Are you currently in love with all your heart to the special someone? Or maybe something, you know? Because people can be in love with 
not only person, but anything at all. Maybe to your profession, your career, your business, you know, your hobby. Yeah. Anything at all can be something that you can be falling in love with. Not only a person. The, the next question is that who is that special someone or something? As what the music said, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And that is each and everyone's prayer should be. All Christians should have, you know, this prayer should be always in their heart and mind. Open the, heart, the eyes of my heart, Lord. You know, as we sing it. Are the eyes of your heart still close to God? Or are we still blind to the rightful truth of God? Because if we are, then we are in trouble. Why do you think is it hard for a Christian? Or why do you think is it hard to love God with all our hearts? Because this is one of the most struggles of most Christians. They cannot love God with all their hearts. What can be the, the ultimate reason or the, the, mo the, the greatest reason for this? Why do most Christians have a hard time to love God first and above all? Because in, if you may see, in Exodus 23, this is the most important commandments of all. You see this, Exodus 23, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. And it was uh, repeated in Deuteronomy 5, 7, which says, You shall have no other gods before me. Let me just uh, tell you that this is the first of the Ten Commandments of God, which he himself had written by his finger in the stone. Now, we have been studying this last time in our Bible studies. And it was a good discussion because, you know, this passage, this, these commandments, is the most important thing that we have to understand. Why did God say this means that, what does it mean when God says there should be no other gods before me? No. Take note, the gods there has a small g. Every time when our God, the Jehovah God that we worship, we adore, is used in the whole of the Bible, there's a big, big g in front. But this one, these gods that the Lord had said, is small gods. It has a very important indication why is it small. Because there shouldn't be any other gods as big as his. You know? He didn't say that you cannot have other gods. He said there should be no other gods before me. If it says before me, what, what does it mean before? It simply means there should be no other gods in front of him. Because if there's somebody, then that is before him. Are you with me? So if you have other gods... Those gods should be at his back. Because before him means he's the first. Is it clear? And it also means he should be above. So before me, meaning to say, very clear, is that he should be the first and above all. Very simple. Do we, are we, are we all okay with that? So, God should be in the first and above all. Because if you put somebody before him, then you are guilty of the very first commandment of the Lord. No. So, now, idolatry, brothers and sisters, is one of the most grievous sins that one can do or can commit. And there are so many forms of idolatry, especially in our generation of today. You know, that's why I'm, I'm always saying people can be in love, you know, uh, with something, not even a person. And if we do that, we are committing 
an idolatry. You know, if you love something or somebody more than your love for God, then in Jeremiah 16, 20, there's a question said, will a man make gods for himself, which are not gods? And the, and the answer to this is yes. In Exodus 20, 4 to 6, it says, you see, after that first greatest commandment of all, you know, there should be no other gods beside me, or before me, sorry, before me, then it turned to the second commandment, which is, you shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness, anything that is in heaven, above or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations. And of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, those who love me and keep my commandments. Just very after that first commandment, then God had literally commanded what should be things that shouldn't be, you know, uh, done by each and everyone. That we should not make any carved images. And so many Christians are guilty of this, brothers and sisters. In Jeremiah 10, 2, 5, says, it says as well, this is all about idolatry. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of a workman with the axe, then decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple. They are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them for they cannot do evil nor can they do any good. No. And this is true, brothers and sisters. Now, you know how... how uh, uh, a sculptor or those people who are selling these uh, images and figurines, statues, wherein people are, are really worshiping and, and uh, serving. They just cut the tree and curve it and then decorate it, paint it, and then dress it up and then you know, make it look so good. And then they sell it and then anybody who has the faith of somebody who really thinks that these statues are worth worshiping, then they buy it and put it in their house, in the altar, then they worship and serve them. This is how they do it. In Jeremiah 10, 69, 6, 9, it says, Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations, for this is your rightful Jew. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish and gold from Ufas, the work of a craftsman and the handsman of a metal smith. Blue and purple are their clothing, they are all the work of a skillful man. So many things, you know, around the world. We, the so-called brothers and sisters in Christ, but yet they are blinded and, decept, uh, and deceived by the thinking that these idols can do something good for them. That's what the Bible says. It has ears that cannot hear. It has eyes that cannot see. It has mouth that cannot speak. It has feet that cannot walk. Very clearly you can see that there's nothing that these figurines, statues can do. You know? But trap us and deceive us 
from the true God that we have. Psalms 115, 4 to 8 said, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hand. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes that they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat, those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. The Word of God, the Bible, is full of things of the truth about this horrible, horrible grave sin that so many Christians are committing against the Lord. And thanks be to God that we are here, you know, being lightened up of the truth of the Lord. In Jeremiah 10, 10 to 11, it says, But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the one that we are worshiping today, and the everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to endure His indignation. Thus you shall say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under this heaven. Remember, the God that we worship, brothers and sisters, is the one who created the heavens and the earth in six literal days. And no other gods have done that except Him. That's why the Word of God says that those gods, those little gods that people are worshiping will perish from the earth and from under these heavens, as what the Lord promised. No. The one true God that we worship in Jeremiah 10, 12, 13, He said, He has made the earth by His power. He has established the world by His wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at His discretion. When He utters His voice, there is a multitude of waters in heavens, and He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of His treasuries. That is the God that we worship and adore. You know, the God who hears, the God who sees, the God who speaks, the God who can do everything. The God that there's nothing impossible. Amen. Amen. Not like the gods that other people worship that cannot do anything. Amen? Amen. Now, maybe Christians are in love with somebody else other than the God that we worship. That's why they cannot love the lord with all their hearts well it is i think it is just the, the the very basic reason why even us you know in matthew 6 24 look at this what does the bible says no one can serve two masters at the same time for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You, we cannot serve God and mammon. You know the mammon there? In other translation, it says money. Yeah? Why do you think God, of all the things on earth, will compare himself to money? What do you think? He didn't compare himself to Obama or to, to uh, Rohola Ayatollah Khomeini or to, uh, to, to even to the devil. He didn't compare himself to Satan, but he compared himself to money. Why, why, why is that so? I mean, why is that of all the things on earth, God said you cannot serve God and money? Money? For the very reason why, brothers and sisters, that the very, very basic enemy or counterpart of God in man's heart is money. That's the real truth. You know? Most people in the world, 
it's either worship God or money. So, that's why it's either you have money as your God or God as your God. Same in Luke 16, 13. The same. No one can serve two masters at the same time. You know. In Tagalog, there's a saying, he said, bawal mamangka sa dalawang ilog. You know? Are you familiar with that? You cannot row in two, literally uh, translation, you cannot row your boat in two rivers. Is that the way it should be? Bawal kang mamangka sa dalawang ilog. You cannot love two people at the same time, at the same degree. Isn't it? Is there anybody who can do that here? Ang tawag sa'yo, two-timer. You cannot do that, you know? It's either really you have to love one more than the other. Yan ang katotohanan, you know? Kaya napakahalaga. It is so important for us to know that we have to be specifically, you know, in love with one only. Totally, total. Uh, meaning to say, all your heart will be given to somebody. You cannot give all your heart to two people. That's what the Bible says. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. The strongest counterpart of God in every man's heart is not the devil, but it is money. You know? Money is the most effective instrument of the devil. Again, it is the most effective instrument of the devil or its weapon to deceive people. And he is so successful in doing so. Not successful in meaning that God is a defeated one. No, that's not what I mean. He is so successful in defeating those people who are not totally in love with God. Because if you are wholeheartedly, all of your heart is with God, believe me, you are the victorious one. The devil cannot touch you. So that's why it is so important for us to understand this. You know, unfortunately, most men in this material world are being deceived and they are loving it. It is a trap, brothers and sisters. A very, very big trap. You know? In Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 10, just to prove to you that the love of money is a very dangerous uh, place to be in. You know? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you can prove this to yourself. No? Even young people can really prove this word of God. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. If you are thinking that the rich people are so blessed, they are far more better than us having God in our lives, you are mistaken and being deceived and being blinded, brothers and sisters. You just don't know how, how so great sorrows and pains and troubles that they are encountering right now. Just imagine, if you're rich, you just cannot walk on the street just by your own without fearing of somebody will harm you. Especially those billionaires and millionaires and, you know, those really, those people that really have so much money in them. They're always in danger of being It's good if they will be like this and they will go to heaven. But no. They don't even believe that there's heaven. Most of them. Because if they do, 
you know, they won't be so much as rich as that. Believe me. It's true that money is so powerful in this world. That's true, no doubt about it. Because this world is under the devil's control. You know? The devil, Satan, is the prince of the world. He has powers. That's why those who are under him, he has total control of them. And they, he is using them still to trap more. He is the prince of this world, and he had put all his power on this material, immaterial, no-value piece of paper. Can you imagine the bills, the, the money that we have? It's just a piece of paper. Don't you realize that? You burn it, it's nothing. It's ash, no value at all. It's not like gold. Gold, if even you burn it, it's still gold. It even become more precious because when you burn the gold, it will become pure, you know? Unlike the piece of paper that we have, the money that was invented by, by the devil himself. It's such a no value, immaterial piece of paper that when you burn it, it's gone. No matter how, how big is it, even it's 5,000 or even if you create a 1 million piece of paper, a bill, if you burn it, it's gone. No value will be able to return on that piece of paper. That's how immaterial and valueless that piece of paper is. But voila, it is the most powerful thing in this world. Why? Because the devil made it like that. In this most wicked, in this most, in this wicked world, that is the most precious thing. And for those whose eyes are blinded by this, brothers and sisters, for those whose eyes are still closed to the truth of the Lord, will remain trapped in this great danger of the love of money. You know? And I pray and hope that we are not. You know? Luke 9.25 says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? and is himself destroyed or lost. In Mark 8, 36, the same thing. It says, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? soul. Do you think there's more important thing in this in your life other than your soul? How much money can you give to redeem your soul from the devil? Mind you, we are all before, before the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for everyone. Everyone belongs to the devil. And that one thing, the divine exchange that took place on that cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed the whole world under, under the control and dominion of the devil. But unfortunately, still so many are trapped and under the control of the devil still. Why? Because of that. Because of the love of money. You know. Mark 8, 36 to 37. Again, can we... For what it will profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Even you become the trillionaire of the world. Is there any trillionaire now? Me. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know? I am rich in Christ. Have you heard any, anybody who is a trillionaire or just a billionaire? Uh, anybody? Who had, uh, even if you become a trillionaire, do you think how, much, how many trillions can you pay? You know? Satan to redeem your soul from him. Have you think about that? You know, even those people who are in deathbeds, millionaires, billionaires, who are very sick, having cancer, you know, fighting for their lives. How many millions or billions do you think 
can they pay so that they can have or they can prolong their lives? Nothing. That's the truth, brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived again and let your hearts be blinded by the snares and traps of the enemy. We are all redeemed, brothers and sisters. I would like to remind you this, that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed us all from the enemy. And don't, don't go back to that place. No. Don't go back to that place because the Lord only died once and there will never be a second redemption to come.